In the great hall of King Harrogate's castle, the clock struck six. Actually, it was eleven minutes past midnight, but the hall was a little darker than it had been at six o'clock or at noon. Yet those who lived in the castle told time by the difference in the dark. There were hours when the hall was cold simply for want of warmth and gloomy for lack of light, when the air was stale and still, and the stones stank of old water because there were no windows to let in the scoring wind. That was daytime. But at night, as some trees hold a living light all day, hold it with the undersides of their leaves until long after sundown, so at night the castle was charged and swarming with darkness, alive with darkness. Then the great hall was cold for a reason. Then the small sounds that slept by day woke up to patter and scratch in the corners. It was night when the old smell of the stones seemed to rise from far below the floor. Light a light, Molly Grew said. Please, can you make a light? Schmendrick muttered something curt and professional. For a moment, nothing happened, but then a strange, sallow brightness began to spread over the floor, scattering itself about the room in a thousand scurrying shards that shone and squeaked. The little night beasts of the castle were glowing like fireflies. They darted here and there in the hall, raising swift shadows with their sickly light and making the darkness even colder than before. "'I wish you hadn't done that,' Molly said. "'Can you turn them off again?' The purple ones, anyways, with the, with the legs, I guess? No, I can't, Schmendrick answered crossly. Be quiet. Where's the skull? The Lady Amalthea could see it grinning from a pillar, lemon small in the shadows and dim as the morning moon, but she said nothing. She had not spoken since she came down from the tower. There, the magician said. He strode to the skull and peered into its split and crumbling eye sockets for a long time, nodding slowly and making solemn sounds to himself. Molly Grew stared with equal earnestness, but she glanced often at Lady Amalthea. At last, Smendrick said, All right, don't stand so close. Are there really spells to make a skull speak? Molly asked. The magician stretched out his fingers and gave her a small, competent smile. There are spells to make everything speak. The master wizards are great listeners, and they devise ways to charm all things of the world, living and dead, into talking to them. That is, most of it being a wizard, seeing and listening. He drew a long breath, suddenly looking away and rubbing his hands together. The rest is technique he said. Well, here we go. Abruptly, he turned to face the skull, put one hand lightly on the pale crown, and addressed it in a deep, commanding voice. The words marched out of his mouth like soldiers, their steps echoing with power as they crossed the dark air. But the skull made no answer at all. I just wondered, the magician said softly, he lifted his hand from the skull and spoke to it again. This time, the sound of the spell was reasonable and cajoling, almost plaintive. The skull remained silent. But it seemed to Molly that a wakefulness slipped across the faceless front and was gone again. In the scuttling light of the radiant vermin, the Lady Amalthea's hair shone like a flower. Appearing neither interested nor indifferent, but quiet in the way that a battlefield is sometimes quiet. She watched as Schmendrick recited one incantation after another to a desert-colored knob of bone that spoke not one more word than she did. Each charm was uttered in a more despairing tone than the last, but the skull would not speak. And yet, Molly Grew was certain that it was aware and listening and amused. She knew the silence of mockery too well to mistake it for death. The clock struck twenty-nine. 
At least it was at that point that Molly lost count. The rusty strokes were still clanking to the floor when Schmendrick suddenly shook both fists at the skull and shouted, All right! All right for you, you pretentious kneecap! How would you like a punch in the eye? On the last words, his voice unraveled completely into a snarl of misery and rage. That's right, the skull said. Yell! Wake up, old haggard! Its own voice sounded like branches creaking and knocking together in the wind. Yell louder, it said. The old man's probably around here somewhere. He doesn't sleep much. Molly gave a small cry of delight, and even the Lady Amalthea moved a step nearer. Schmendrick stood with his fists shut and no triumph in his face. The skull said, Come on, ask me how to find the Red Bull. You can't go wrong asking my advice. I'm the King's Watchman, set to guard the way to the Bull. Even Prince Lear doesn't know the secret way, but I do. A little timidly, Molly Grew asked, If you are truly on guard here, why don't you give the alarm? Why, why do you offer to help us instead of summoning the men-at-arms? The skull gave a rattling chuckle. I've been up on this pillar a long time, it said. I was Haggard's chief henchman once, until he smote off my head for no reason. That was back in the days when he was being wicked to see if that's what he really liked to do. It wasn't, but he thought he might as well get used to may as well get some use out of my head. So he stuck it up here to serve as a sentinel. Under the circumstances, I'm not as loyal to King Haggard as I might be. Schmendrick spoke in a low voice. Answer the riddle, then. Tell us the way to the Red Bull. No, said the skull. Then it laughed like mad. Why not? Molly cried furiously. What kind of a game... The skull's long, yellow jaws never moved, but it was some time before the mean laughter chattered to a halt. Even the hurrying night things paused for a moment, stranded in their candy light until it stopped. "'I'm dead,' said the skull. "'I'm dead, and I'm hanging in the dark, watching over Haggard's property. The only small amusement I have is to irk and exasperate the living, and I don't get much chance of that.' It's a sad loss, because in life, mine was of a particularly exasperating nature. You'll pardon me, I'm sure, if I indulge myself with you just a little. Try me tomorrow. Maybe I'll tell you tomorrow. But we have no time, Molly pleaded. Schmendrick nudged her, but she rushed on, stepping close to the skull and appealing directly to its uninhabited eyes. We have no time. We may be too late now. I have time, the skull replied reflectively. It's really not so good to have time. Rush, scramble, desperation, this missed and that left behind, those others too big to fit into such a small space. That's the way life was meant to be. You're supposed to be too late for some things. Don't worry about it. Molly would have entreated further, but the magician gripped her arm and pulled her aside. Be still, he said in a swift, fierce voice. Not a word, not another word. The damn thing spoke, didn't it? Maybe that's all the riddle requ requires. Oh, it isn't, the skull informed him. I'll talk as much as you like, but I won't tell you anything. That's pretty rotten, isn't it? You should have seen me when I was alive. 